Babies are born in the United States every day. Anybody just want to shout out a number? Guess? 10,000. Very good. Is that a doctor? <laughs> 10,829 babies born every day in the United States of America. That's almost 4 million kids. <laughs> That's crazy to me. That means every eight seconds, bam, a baby is born. It also means that uh, 10,000 times a day, somebody has to come up with another name for one of these babies. And I got thinking about that. And, you know, people who keep track of these things keep track, uh, other groups of people keep track of the most popular names. Some people want to name their kids, you know, a popular name. Others are like, I want my name for my kid to be completely unique. And so they'll even take a name that's popular and just change the spelling so that you, that name is unique. But as long as they've been keeping track of this kind of stuff, there's always been one name that's either at or near the bottom, year after year after year. That name. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm really hoping there's nobody here that's named their kid Judas. But maybe, maybe that you have. It's actually a beautiful name. I don't know if you realize this. It's a beautiful name. I'm not trying to encourage anybody to name their kid Judas. You know what the name Judas means? It comes from the Hebrew name Judah, which means to praise, or he shall be praised. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. He's called the Lion of Judah. You know, Judah is a beautiful name in the Old Testament. It's a, it's a beautiful name today. Judas is a derivation of that name. So people who like Judah either named their kid that or maybe Jude, beautiful name. Judy, beautiful name. But very few people will name their kid Judas. Why? Because it's come to mean betrayer. That's not what it means, but that's what it's come to mean. This is a, a sad and strange stat. I, I guess it's sad. Over the last 10 years, the name Judas has leaped to um, a higher number. More and more people are naming their kids Judas. Uh, I don't want to make a big social commentary about that. It's just an interesting thought. Hmm. It's still not a really popular name, but it's a lot more popular than it used to be. What, what's, what's going on there? I don't really know, but if you've been with me in the Servolution series, we've been looking at John chapter 12, and we, the last two weeks we've been reading about Judas, but today I want to actually look at Judas's appearance in this passage in John chapter 12, and I'd love it if you've turned with me to, to John 12, and... Um, you know, as I've been reading this passage, the first eight verses, I, I've been telling you the last couple of weeks that John is painting a, a, a servolution. He's painting pictures of serving. And we've looked at Martha and Mary. Today we're going to look at Judas. And this is, this is how this fits in as he climaxes with the story of Jesus, the Messiah, the King, washing the disciples' feet. But along the way, he's telling these stories. And we talked about why Judas is showing up, and today we're going to find out. So John chapter 12, verses 4, the first three verses of this chapter, telling us a story about a special dinner given in honor of Jesus just a couple days before he dies. Just get that in your brain. It's just a couple days before Jesus dies. Um, this meal is given in his honor. Martha serves, Mary serves. Mary serves by pouring out this expensive perfume this extravagant ointment on Jesus, on his feet. Mark and Matthew, when they tell the story, say he poured it, they, she poured it on his head as well, and it was on his clothes. And so this aroma fills the room. At that moment, we hear Judas. Now let's stand to our feet because we want to honor God's word. At that moment that the fragrance is filling the air, we get Judas. Bam. Judas, but one of Jesus' disciples... Judas Iscariot. He has to use the word Iscariot because Judas was such a popular name. A lot of moms and dads naming their kids Judas. They had to clarify, this is Judas Iscariot. Further clarification, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. 
And John says he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. We talked about that last week. Then he says, you'll always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. Okay, you may be seated. When I uh, come to the story of Judas, people are like, well, what are you going to say about Judas? How would you feel if I said, I want to preach a sermon about how you are a lot, a lot of you are a lot like Judas. Some of you are getting uncomfortable. I was afraid you were going to do that. that that's, what, 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 why else would a preacher preach about Judas? Because he wants to point out in our life areas where we're a lot like Judas. What if I were to tell you there are um, some ways that I wish you were like Judas, that I hope you're like Judas, Going to get anybody's attention? <laughs> I'm willing to bet you've never heard a sermon. I know I've never had one, and I've never preached one on ways that I wish or I hope that you or the people I'm preaching to are like Judas. So fill in the blank, put on your seatbelt. Uh, this is going to be an interesting little sermon because as I'm digging into the Word of God and going, okay, what's going on here, trying to let the Word of God speak, this is some of the things that I found this week. And this is going to be an unusual sermon, but I believe God's going to use it. So um, why, why would anyone say that there are some ways we want to be like Judas? Well, let's just start at the very beginning of this, this section, verse 4. What does it say about Judas? First thing we understand is he's one of Jesus' disciples. Now, I want to ask you to... Lay aside all those horrible things you've heard about Judas. I mean, not lay aside forever, but we'll talk about them. But let's go back to the first century. Let's go back to right now, if we can, to John chapter 12. And I want you to know that there's nobody amongst the disciples, there's nobody in that room except for Jesus who knows what Judas is about to do. Let that sink in. What they saw Judas was is, as verse 4 says, one of Jesus' disciples. Judas is a disciple of Jesus. So he's a follower of Jesus. Um, We've talked a lot about what does it mean to be a disciple. Someone who follows someone, usually a master, follows them to learn from them in order to become like them. Nowhere... In the stories of the disciples leading up to this, do we hear any stories about Judas, you know, kind of skipping off and doing his own thing while Jesus is teaching the disciples or while Jesus is with the disciples? There's, there's no sense of Judas being different. And this is why the night before Jesus was betrayed, when he said, one of you is going to be betray, is gonna be, betray me, Nobody had a clue he was talking about Judas. I want that to sink in. The people who had been with Judas day and night for, you know, for three years, they saw nothing in his life that would cause them to think he isn't any different than any other disciple, follower of Jesus. Certainly he's not a betrayer. Let's, let's just, you know, just have some clarity about this. Go, go to with me to Luke chapter 6. This is one of the... Um, one of the uh, lists of the disciples, and whenever the disciples are mentioned, because of course the Gospels were written, you know, many, many, many years after Jesus. And so they all knew at this point that Judas was a betrayer. And so whenever his, Luke 6, whenever he's mentioned, he's always mentioned last. And typically they'll say he was a traitor. But as the story's unfolding, there's nothing in the text that helps us see he's a betrayer. Um, Luke chapter 6, I want you to see this. When Jesus had been praying all night long, and when morning came, he he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them who he appointed, designated apostles. And then there's the list, boom, boom, boom. Last name, Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Watch this screen. Look, Look at the words that I'm highlighting. This is true of Judas. He's called by Jesus. 
He's chosen by Jesus. He's designated. He's appointed by Jesus. It's, isn't that amazing that Judas is called? Some people say, well, many are called, few are chosen. He's chosen and appointed by Jesus himself. And for three years, he looks like any other disciple. He left like every other disciple. Everything to follow Jesus. That's pretty impressive. Let's just give Judas some, you know, a little bit of respect, a little bit of, you know, honor here. For three years, he thinks he's following Jesus. Maybe two and a half years. He's, he thinks he's doing the right thing. I mean, he is if he's following Jesus. But he's a model disciple in, in, in many ways. I, I keep saying this. There's nothing to help us see otherwise. He's committed. You know, you leave everything to follow somebody. You left your job. You left your family to follow Jesus. And that means you literally, literally walked around the nation of Israel following this master, this rabbi. Let's call him that. This rabbi Jesus. And you, you don't have a pension. You don't have anything to fall back on. You don't have a job. If this thing goes south, you're in trouble. That's commitment. That's what Judas did. So before we rush to condemn him, let's just come to terms with what the Bible says about him. Okay, back to John chapter 12. We're just taking one phrase at a time. So verse 4, John 12, one of his disciples committed, left everything following Jesus. Judas, we already know what that name means, to, to praise. Iscariot, very next word. What does the word Iscariot mean? Well, scholars are not sure. They're divided. Some people think it's from the Hebrew Ishkarioth, which means man from Kerioth. Okay, well, we're not exactly sure what Kerioth is, but that's, even if we were, that's, some people think it's in the north, some people think it's in the south. Other scholars, and this is, I'm in this group of people, believe that this name Iscariot comes from Sicarios, which means men of the dagger. They were a group of Jewish zealots who were revolutionaries, who hated the fact that Rome was occupying their country. And remember, Rome's occupation wasn't a peaceful one. It was brutal. It was vicious. And Rome murdered people senselessly all the time. And so there was this revolutionaries, and these underneath the revolutionaries were these zealots, and amongst the zealots was this group called the Sicarii, and they carried daggers in their cloak. And in big crowds, when people were pushed against each other, they would pull out their daggers, stab a Roman leader or a Roman family member or somebody who was a part of the occupation, and then slip into the crowd. This happened all the time. And Judas is, a, you know, is seen as kind of this revolutionary, this passionate, passionate revolutionary. Now, most Jewish men were passionate anyways, but it seems like Judas was a part of this these zealots, maybe a part of this specialty force called the Sicarii. It's, it's funny how many times Judas, when he's mentioned with the disciples, most of the time he's mentioned with Simon the Zealot. So you get Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, Judas the assassin, Judas the, the men of the dagger. And this explains one of the reasons why, Jesus, why Judas was attracted to Jesus, because he saw, as we saw last week, this revolutionary figure in Jesus, this, this guy who, when he, he taught, he, he was just like he created vision about how things could be different. When he taught, he painted a picture of the kingdom of God and painted a picture of throwing off you know, every other you know, fetter and following God. And, and as Judas listened to the teaching of Jesus, he was just, his heart was stirred. There's another thing you can write down is that for three years, he followed and listened to the teaching, heard Jesus teaching. Whenever Jesus said anything that had any kind of revolutionary tone, Judas was all about it. Yeah, you know, maybe even saying amen, you know. I'm about that. This is why I'm following this guy. He's, he, he's, he, I believe he's going to bring the kingdom of God Listen to how many times I said the word God right here. I believe he's going to bring the kingdom of God. I believe he is God's man to bring the revolution. I believe he is God's Messiah. There's no question that Judas believed in God, not just because he's a Jewish boy, but because he sees in Jesus God's revolutionary leader, God's Messiah, God's anointed one, the one that God would send to set Israel free. 
I'm trying to help you get into the first century and to, and to hear the rhetoric and the language and the hopes that people had about Jesus, especially the hopes that we believe Judas had about Jesus. Because when he looked at Jesus and he compared it to his understanding of the Bible, it's like, yeah, man, he fits. This is good. Like, like everybody else who knew their Bible well in the first century, Judas thought that Jesus was a good fit for what he believed about the Messiah. Actually, let me drill down a little bit on that. I, I believe that, that Judas knew the Bible well, not just because he saw that Jesus fit the Messiah picture, but secondly, because, because he was a Jewish boy, he knew the Bible well. This is an automatic. Every Jewish boy went to school diligently. Once in a while, a Jewish girl could go, but every Jewish boy went. And when it came time to study history, they pulled out the scrolls of the Old Testament. When it came time to study politics, they pulled out the scrolls of the Old Testament. When it came time to study biography or you know, revolutionary leaders, they talk, pulled out the scrolls of the Old Testament. <clears throat> No matter what you're studying, theology, ethics, politics, they pulled out the scrolls of the Old Testament. It was their textbook. So day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they heard the stories of the Old Testament. A lot of Jewish boys had portions of the Old Testament, big portions, memorized. <clears throat> Oftentimes it was the book of Deuteronomy they would memorize. And, and so it, to grow up, as a good Jewish boy, you knew the scriptures really inside and out just because you grew up there. It's kind of like if I were to mention the name George Washington, everybody here instantly, I know who George Washington is. And it's not because you're, you have a degree in American history. It's not because you've studied in depth American history. No, because you went to school in America most of you probably. And when you go to school in America, you hear the story of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. You, know, you hear the stories of you know, Declaration of Independence. You know the stories because you kept hearing them. This is the way Judas was. This is the way every Jewish boy was. They knew the Bible well. Furthermore, when we get back into the text, Judas you know, ob objects. Why wasn't this, um, next verse, why wasn't this perfume sold? And the money given to the poor, where did that idea come from? Well, it, it probably came from Deuteronomy chapter 15, which says, there will always be the poor people in the land. This, this, is, this is what Scripture says. Therefore, I command you, be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. I, I believe that, that, that Judas is actually referring to this passage because this is where he got the idea that you should, you know, sell things, you should give, give money to the poor. And when Jesus answers him in verse uh, 7, it's like he knows what Judas is thinking. Judas, I, I know you're referring to Deuteronomy 15, 11. Let me just quote it for you. You will always have the poor in the land. You know, Judas, I know the Bible better than you do. Okay? I, I understand that we're commanded to care for the poor. I, I get that. That's, you know, you've, haven't you seen this in my ministry? This is what I've been about. Loving, caring, serving the poor. So Judas, don't, don't play the, the poor card in me. I get that. But we're in a moment right here where it's not a comparison between me and the poor. It's not a comparison of value. It's a comparison of I'm about to die as the savior of the world. So nothing, not the poor, not your mom, not your dad, not your wife, nothing is of greater importance than paying attention to understanding what's happening right here. I'm about to, to die for the sins of the world. It's not saying the poor don't matter. When Jesus says, the poor you'll always have with you, but you won't always have me. No, 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 don't misunderstand that as to not care for the poor. It's, it's, that's not what Jesus is saying. And so as a church, we care for the poor. If we're gonna follow Jesus, we need to care for the poor. And, you know, just a couple of recent examples. I could give tons of examples of how you guys are doing this and how I want to challenge you to do even more, to follow Jesus, is to pay attention to people who are hurting, to care for them. You know, I'm driving the other day um, down the street, and I see a guy who looks really poor. I, I pull over. The guy behind me is not happy about it because I pulled over rather quickly. You know, roll down my window. Hey, can I help you? You know, just we, we care for the poor, small ways, big ways. We sent a team down, I shouldn't say we sent, a group of people volunteered. 
volunteered to go down to Houston and care for people who had become poor, who lost their houses, who lost everything. This is what we do because we're followers of Jesus. And by the way, uh, uh, when uh, Pierce Brown, one of our guys that went down there, sent me a picture of a guy who is a good example of serving the poor, he, with all, that's, there's our van. With all this brokenness down there, this guy sets up a, a little you know, cooking place to, to feed people who are volunteering, to feed people who don't have anything to eat. And uh, he, he's, he's uh, cooking, I think, a 50, uh, I lost the numbers, 50 pounds of hamburger a day. Uh, he's cooking all kinds of hot dogs, all kinds of tortillas, and just, just you know, flooding the streets with food because people are hurting. This is what Christians have always done. Why do we have schools? Why do we have hospitals? Because Christians in the past said, hey, we need to create a way to help people. So they created a hospital. Christians are the ones, people who are following Jesus are the ones that, that started hospitals, started schools. It is our history. It is our, our reputation. So let us always be people who care for the poor. Don't read Jesus' words in John 12, 8 to say you don't have to care for the poor. Just care about Jesus. If you care about Jesus, you will care about the poor. Are we clear about this? This is not a sermon about caring for the poor, but I just couldn't resist that, you know, talking about that because this is, this is what we do at Open Door. This is what we will always do, and this is what I encourage you to do in, in small and big ways, to love people in the name of Jesus, especially those who are hurting or who are missing something or are poor or, or whatever. And um, it looks like maybe Judas did this from time to time. John <laughs> says he really didn't care for the poor. So uh, we'll, we'll take John's words because they're, anoint, they're inspired by the scripture. Jesus, John says he really didn't care for the poor, but he just said he did. He's, he just, you know, used the Bible as a way to say, well, I really care for the poor. But let's, let's finish up with Judas because there's one other thing I, I see about his life that I, I find really significant. It's in this phrase where John says he didn't really care for the poor, but because he was the keeper of the bag... Judas was the CFO of the little 501c3 that Jesus was starting up. Judas was the treasurer. He was the accountant. Judas served God, but not just as the treasurer of Jesus' little band. Remember when I talked about how uh, oftentimes you have a list of the disciples in the New Testament and Judas is always last? A couple times during those lists, then the, the, uh, it says, and Jesus would then send out the disciples to heal, to cast out demons, to, um, to preach the gospel. This, this happened multiple times in the gospels. And every single time, Judas is in the list. Every single time, Judas is a part of those who are preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons. In one place it says, healing sickness of every kind. Uh, another place it says, casting out every demon. And again, there's no indication that it was all the disciples except for, Jesus, for Judas. Every indication is that it was Judas was a part of them. One time Jesus says, I'm sending you out two by two. Guess who Judas Iscariot's partner was? Simon the Zealot. <laughs> they go out and, and they come back. And another time, he sends them out two by two. 70 of them go back and they come back and they go, man, the, 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 the demons are crumbling in our name and trembling in our name. And we're healing people. This is exciting. No indication that Judas wasn't a part of that. In fact, if he hadn't been able to heal, preach the gospel, cast out demons, surely the disciples around him would have said, whoa, whoa, everybody's doing it but you, Judas. Let this sink in for a minute. Judas Iscariot preached the gospel. <laughs> Judas, the betrayer, cast out demons. <clears throat> Judas, the traitor, healed people of all kinds of diseases. Does that blow your mind? That should give you pause the next time you hear about somebody who's healing people, who's casting out demons, who's you know, maybe a great communicator, and you're like, whoa, look, he's, he's casting out demons, he's, he's healing people, he's a great communicator, he must be of God. Not necessarily, he might think he's of God, 
or he, he may be you know, wrestling with some things. He might not be of God at all. Just, just be careful. Just because somebody is doing big things like that, automatically they must be of God. There is, there was, again, I think I said this five times now, there was nothing in Judas's life while he's preaching, healing, casting out demons, serving the poor, taking care of the money. There's, there's nothing that disciples see day to day that's causing them to go, when Jesus says at the Last Supper, one of you will betray me, for all the disciples to say, Judas, you snake. Nobody. In fact, they all said, well, is it, is it me? Is it, it's not me, is it, Lord? Because they saw in Judas a fellow disciple who's, who's serving. Now, we are in this Servolution series, so you know, let me just remind you of last week. We're talking about a lifestyle of serving. We're talking about finding a place to serve. Last week I put a list of places that you can serve. You can start jumping in. As you walk out today at, the, at every, every venue, there would be a table there with a, a sheet of paper that says, hey, check out some places where you can serve. just want you to know there's all these different places that you can say, I want to be a part as a, as a lifestyle of serving, as finding my place to serve, as a follower of Jesus who serves God and serves people. I want to invite you to jump in. But when, when you check off one of these boxes, I want you to know, you're not saying, sign me up for the next 20 years. I'm locked in. You're just saying, I want to explore. Part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to be a person who serves. Part of what it means to be a disciple is to be one who serves. So just got to get that little commercial in there. Uh, so let's look at these six things. Uh, and for those of you who love numbers, there's a reason why I chose six. There's six things about Judas. Wouldn't you look at that list and go, wow, if you didn't know it was Judas, wouldn't you say, now that's a good and faithful servant? Come on, say yes, because you, you, you know where I'm going, but st you just still, that looks good on paper. And Judas looks good on paper, but we all know Judas was not a model disciple. He, we, we don't look to him and say, this is what it looks like. I, I'm not holding up. I want to be careful. I'm not holding Judas to say, he's the model. I'm just saying that when you look at his life, these are good things. And I hope you're doing these kinds of things. But now let's get real clear. Ways I hope you're not, capital N-O-T, so no one gets confused. Pastor Jim was saying we should follow Judas. I heard him. You should, it was on the screen. Ways we should be like Jesus. Okay, everybody look at this screen. Ways I hope you're not like Judas. Okay, so go back to the text. Verse 4. We know his, he's a disciple. We know his name. And then this phrase. You might have skipped right over this. Who was later to betray him. That's a small thing that's being said there who was later to betray him. But again, it's one more way of helping me see that Judas did not come to the disciples as a betrayer. I don't believe that Judas joined the disciples as a way to infiltrate the disciples and bring Jesus down. That is, that is, I've heard that preached, but that is not consistent with what I see in the story of Judas. What I see is a man who hears the revolutionary talk of Jesus and says, I want to be a part of that. Hears, uh, senses something of the presence of God in Jesus and says, I want to be a part of that. Hears a vision of the kingdom of God and says, I want to be a part of that. He hears all these good things, which is some reasons why you and I have decided to follow Jesus. And says, I want to be a part of that. I want to make a difference. I want to you know, be a follower and then to be chosen and called and appointed by Jesus, this is great. I, I want to learn. But John says he was later to betray him. And I don't know if you remember, but when I put Luke chapter 6 on the screen, I know, we, we noticed at the very bottom, he became a traitor. Here's what I'm arguing. That Judas, like you, right now, because you're in church, Judas, like you, thinks he's following Jesus. I think I am. Let me just not say you. I think I'm following Jesus, and I am. But, but Judas followed Jesus to a point. Judas left everything to follow Jesus to a point. 
when did he actually become a traitor? You don't have to agree with me, but I don't think it's the New Testament's witness that he was always the betrayer. I think he became a betrayer. What happened? I think we can uh, reproduce, we can put together a few things. Uh, If I was just just preaching on Judas, I could do a lot more, but uh, just staying close to our text, down in verse uh, 5 when John says Judas didn't, didn't care about the poor because he was a thief as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself. Every word in the Bible matters. I see in that little phrase, help himself, a problem in Judas what, that we call self-centeredness. He's serving himself. As the treasurer of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus, he somehow is twisting his following of Jesus, his serving God, to be a way of serving himself. He helped himself. And so as he's serving Jesus, as he's serving God, he twists that to be a way of serving himself. You know what? You and I do the same thing. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But we start off to serve God, and then sin sneaks up and takes us by surprise. And we find, in reality, I'm doing this for my own self. (laughs) I'm doing this because it makes me feel good. I'm doing this because I love the accolades. I'm doing this because it makes me look like a good disciple. And when we see those things in our lives, let's confess them. Let's repent of them. That's self-centeredness. It's dangerous. It's sinful. It leads us away. I think self-centeredness is the best way to define sin. Sin is focused on me. I'm centered on me. And that creates all kinds of ugly behavior. I'm not focused on God who made me, who called me to his glory. I'm not focused on you, how I could love you and serve you. I'm focused on me. Even though I'm a pastor in the church, even though I've been a pastor for many, many years, I, I still find areas in my life where I'm like, really, Jim? You're st- you're st- that, that was all about you. And so when that happens, I confess it as sin. <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit points out self-centeredness in your life, what do you do? rationalize it away, well, you know, that's not really what that was all about. That's just a mistake. Nobody's perfect. That's sin. Call it as sin. Confess it. I'm going to be careful here because when you serve God but let self-centeredness rise, you're on the pathway to being a Judas. Nobody suddenly becomes this traitor, this betrayer, it's a process which could, should cause all of us to tremble and ask in honesty, God, Psalm 139, 23, search my heart and see if there's any wicked way in me. I mean, did anybody notice how on, uh, on, your, on your outline it said under point one that Judas served God and now I'm saying he served himself? Anybody notice that? Anybody bothered by, well, make up your mind, Jim, what is it? Is he serving God or is he serving himself? That's a really good question. Which is it? Which is it? And how do I know whether I'm serving God? How do you know at any given moment whether you're serving God or whether you're actually serving yourself? Especially after I've just said that Serving yourself is a pathway towards destruction. It is a pathway towards becoming a Judas. You don't want to live a life of self-centeredness. So how do I know the difference? You mean it's not enough just to sign up and serve somewhere and I'm good? No, it's, it, your serving doesn't save you. Please don't ever think all this, you know, all this energy we're talking about, how you need to be a servant, how we want to be a part of this serve illusion because Jesus served, we serve. Don't think for a minute that you're serving. Any amount of it saves you <laughs> or, ma- or makes, you, makes God think highly, more highly of you. No, serving is what you do because you're grateful for what God's done, not to earn God's favor, amen? So, you know, no, we don't serve to be noticed or to get saved or anything like that. So, What's going on in our heart? You can serve God and you can serve self. That's the wickedness of the human heart. That's the deceitfulness of the human heart that 
that you can be doing both. So how, how, do, I, how, how do I know the difference? <laughs> well, I put in your outline, look at how you react when things don't go the way you want. Where did I get that from? John chapter 12. But not just John chapter 12, but also Matthew. Let's turn with me to Matthew chapter 26, would you? Because I keep telling you that Matthew and Mark tell the same story, and they add a little detail here and there. This is worth seeing. Matthew 26. <clears throat> Matthew 26. Um, if you have a Bible, and most of, you, most of you do have these kind of Bibles, that has little paragraph headings, find the one that says, Jesus anointed at Bethany, or Jesus anointed by a woman. It's uh, Matthew 26, verse 6. So it's the same story of Mary anointing Jesus with his perfume. In this version, it, has, it says the disciples said, hey, how come this, wasn't, this, money wasn't, uh, this perfume wasn't sold and given to the poor? Jesus responds in verse um, 12 and 13, and then look immediately at the next verse. It says, then... I'm going to preach a whole sermon on then. <laughs> then is a connecting word. The writer, Matthew, is trying to help us see that what just happened is connected with what's just about to happen. They're not just happening to stand next to each other in the text. There's a connection. What just happened? Jesus just defended this woman for pouring perfume on his body. Then, one of the 12, who is it? The one called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and asked, what are you willing to give me if I... In your Bibles, it probably says hand over or deliver. The Greek word is um, prodidomai, which means to betray. What will you give me if I betray him to you? So they counted out to her in 30 pieces. You know the story. 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to, same Greek word, betray him. Do you see what's happening Jesus gets anointed with perfume. Judas corrects him, corrects her. Jesus corrects Judas. And then Judas goes out to the chief priests. Do you see the, the, the flow here? What's happening? Judas got his feelings hurt. Judas got corrected. He got rebuked. He's, he's kind of in turmoil because he's not sure. He's asking questions about, is this Jesus the guy I thought he was? How come he's not taking more charge here? What's going on? So he's going to try to push Jesus to do something. And he's getting upset about what's happening. Jesus corrects him, rebukes him. Judas responds, what? <laughs> With this language of betrayal. I will hand him over. I will turn him over. I will betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Brings me back to the statement. How do I know whether I'm serving God or myself? How do I react when things don't go my way? Let's, let's just have a little fun here. How do you react when things don't go your way? How do you react when Jesus challenges you, corrects the way you spend money. That's what he did with Judas. How do, you, how do you respond when Jesus exposes hypocrisy in your life? Let me just step on some toes. How do you react when a decision is made in the church that you disagree with? How do you react when the preacher, whether it's me or somebody else, says something that just hurts you, cuts you, exposes you, you disagree with? I don't like that. How do you react? Well, here's how people react. They leave. They gossip. They complain. They fight. This, this is what happens in the church all the time. And it's what happened to Jesus' disciples several places. It's what's happening to Judas. Do you see the danger of responding when you get hurt? When you, something happens that you strongly disagree with? when Jesus rebukes you, when somebody else corrects you, when you feel exposed, when and any of these things happen to you, you're at a vulnerable moment. And what happens in that vulnerable moment is your heart gets exposed. This is one way I hope you're not like Judas, that when you get hurt, when you get when you get to disagree with somebody, when you get stung, when things happen, that you don't, out of serving yourself, say, well, I'm, I'm going to take things in my own hands, or I'm going to just leave, or I'm going I'm to fight this thing. I, you don't want to be like Judas, because you are like Judas, and I am too, in that you will get your feelings hurt. 
You will get tweaked from time to time. Honestly, if I, if as a preacher, if I'm not hurting your feelings once in a while, then I'm not preaching very well. I love the definition of preaching, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> there should be times where you go, ooh, that stung, ooh, that, ooh, man, I, that hurts. Not that I'm trying to hurt you, but the gospel hurts sometimes, doesn't it? Nobody, not many people said amen there. <laughs> Just so you know, I get hurt by the gospel. The Holy Spirit points out, I think I've already said that, the Holy Spirit points out sin in my life. It's what happens when we get hurt, stung, rebuked, corrected, tweaked, you know, point exposed. It's what we do with that, right? That's the difference. Let me point out something to you. I just saw this week. I, in all my years of studying the Bible, I never saw this before. I can't believe it. I can't believe I've never seen this. I'm st- still in Matthew 26. A couple verses later, they're at, the, they're at their dinner. Jesus says, in Matthew's version, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples say, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Matthew 26, verse 21, 22. Then Jesus, you know, turns to Judas and says, you know, um, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The one who um, has dipped his bread into the bowl with me will betray me. Verse 25, then Judas says, surely not I, Rabbi. Let me point out something to you. Do you see the difference between calling Jesus Rabbi and calling him Lord? Rabbi means teacher. It even means exalted teacher. It's a, very, it's a word of honor, name of honor. But if all you see as Jesus, as a master teacher, as an honorable teacher, and you never surrender to him as Lord, there's your problem right there. I never saw this before. No commentary pointed out. I just was reading it, and I'm like, oh, well, how come I never saw that? This idea of calling him Lord implies that I'm not, that I've surrendered my life. And we need to move from understanding Jesus as a great prophet, a great teacher, a great healer, to Lord. If he just stays a great prophet, a great teacher, a great healer, a great miracle worker, but we never surrender our lives to him, then we're in danger of serving in the church unsurrendered. Now, I want to push the point here a little bit because some of you are like, well, I, saw, I, I call Jesus Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus. So, I, you know, that's not me. Okay. Remember one time when Jesus said, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord? Anybody finish it? But not do what I say. It's not what you call Jesus that matters. It's what you do with Jesus. You can call him Lord God, but not surrender your life to him. Are there people in churches who confess the creeds, who sing the songs, who teach Bible lessons, who know the Bible, who are the six things of, of, of Judas, but are serving unsurrendered? You bet there are. Are you one of them? I hope not. Am I one of them? I hope not. I don't think so. But I know how deceitful the heart is. Don't let this sermon fly by without you asking the question, am I surrendered? If you pay attention to these things, the sermon outline, the sermon is called How to Serve Faithfully. Well, here's how you serve faithfully. The only way to serve faithfully is to serve surrendered, to, to, to practice living a not my will but yours be done kind of life. Many of you know it because I've said it you know, multiple times that I, I roll out of bed every morning, you know, just about every morning, roll out of bed, land on my knees and say something like this. Lord, today I want to love you. I want to love people. I want to live surrendered. I give you this day. First thing I do. Sometimes I get tired of saying that, that thing and so I, I'll, I'll elaborate on what it means to love God and what it means to love people. And this is one of the ways I elaborate on live surrendered. Lord, today I want to live a not my will but yours be done kind of life. That's what Jesus said. That's his prayer. Not my will, but yours be done. You, you can have some fun with this. Uh, an M- M- N- NMWBYBD, put that on a T-shirt. Now, what does that mean? It means not my will, but yours be done. I, this is the way I want to live my life. Because I know the deceitfulness of my heart. Because I know temptation. I know how Satan works. Satan can quote Scripture. 
Satan can twist words. I don't want to give him any room in my life. I want to surrender. I want to surrender my life. So here's my question I want to leave with you. Are you serving surrendered? Actually, there's two questions there. <laughs> First one, are you serving? If not, why, why not? Jump in. And then the second question, if, if you are serving, are you doing it? Just going through the motions? Are you doing it out of obligation? Are you, are you serving unsurrendered? Because if you are, today's your day. You don't have to pay money. You don't have to come down in front of the altar. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to make a big deal. All you need to do is in the quietness of your heart, sincerely before God, just say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender. You see how simple this is? It's not words, but it's, it doesn't need a show. You know, if you want to come to the altar, awesome, come to the altar. But the important thing is, is in your heart, surrender. Say to the Lord, all I am is yours. I surrender all. Now, maybe you're praying that for the first time. That's how you become a Christian. You surrender your life. Lord, I'm, I repent of my sin, and I surrender to you. You be the Lord of my life. I surrender. If you've already done that, then you live surrendered. And if this sermon has poked you in any way, respond by saying, God, I, all I am is yours. Even if it hasn't poked you, tell, tell him that. All I am is yours. I want to serve. I want to live surrendered. Amen? That's, that's what I invite you to pray. Let's stand to our feet. And oh God, as we pray, may every person, not, not just a couple, not, not a lot, may every person hear your Holy Spirit addressing their heart. Are you serving? Surrendered. And whatever the answer is, you know, Lord. And we know. So here's our response. In every venue, we stand to our feet and we say, All I am is yours. I, I lift my hands, I bow my knee, I surrender my heart. I I abandon. Abandon myself to you. Take me. Use me. I'm yours. Come on, guys. All the way all over our church. Say that. I, I surrender. I'm yours. I surrender. I'm yours. Use me. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus who lived a not my will but yours be done kind of life. So I surrender here and now. And we do this in Jesus' name. Amen.